Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. The Prime Minister announces change on National Aboriginal Day. This is your space. But he's called out on what hasn't changed. The Prime Minister used to say that with a Liberal government, oil water advisories would be a thing of the past, but that hasn't happened. How can he be proud of that record? And an Indigenous artist takes us back to the place where he faced death and embraced life. I didn't jump off that bridge, thank God, but I flew. A new U.S. health care plan shrouded in secrecy. Plus, no land, no problem. Cape Breton looks to the past to preserve the future of cattle farming. It's not just about the land, uh, uh, which is a, a very, very important part, but it's about the community as a whole. It was a 13-word declaration from the Prime Minister to celebrate National Aboriginal Day. Quote, no relationship is more important to Canada than the relationship with Indigenous peoples. But even as Justin Trudeau marked the occasion, talked about continuing down a path of reconciliation, announced changes to reflect that spirit of respect, critics asked about that important relationship and about action on the pressing issues that still haunt this country's Indigenous population. Tom Perry starts our coverage tonight. In Ottawa, the ceremonies began at sunrise. Indigenous people gathered in the shadow of Parliament Hill, hopeful this day might mark the dawn of a new relationship with the federal government. It was a day of at least symbolic transformation. The Prime Minister gathering with First Nations, Métis and Inuit leaders, confirming the former U.S. Embassy that has sat vacant for two decades across from Parliament will become a new Indigenous centre. Until now, there hasn't been a space within our parliamentary precinct dedicated to and for Indigenous peoples. That changes today. The Prime Minister also announcing today he would honour a demand that he strip the building that houses his own office of its name. Langevin Block is named for Hector Louis Langevin, a member of Sir John A. Macdonald's cabinet and an architect of the residential school system. Thank you so much for changing that name. That's a big thing because that's part of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a central pledge of the Liberal government, yet suicide remains a crisis for Indigenous youth and a lack of housing and clean water still plagues many communities. All facts the opposition was today eager to point out. How can he be proud of that record? The government argues change takes time, but even its announcements today have come in for criticism. The former U.S. Embassy is an ornate structure that still bears the markings of its former residence. Some Indigenous architects wonder if it's truly suited to its new purpose. It's absolutely a colonial building. It is, it is a symbol of, of colonial uh, occupation in North America and around the world. To the government, though, the most important symbol is where the building is located. This is the prime piece of real estate in this country. It looks straight to the Parliament buildings. It was um, the American Embassy, the most important relationship to Canada. And now yeah, this building will house First Nations, Inuit, and Métis as the most important relationship to Canada. The hope is that work could be completed by 2023, but Indigenous leaders first need to agree on what the new centre will do and what it will look like. The goal is for it to become a symbol of reconciliation, but that's still a long way off. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. One of the most important treaties in Canadian history has been dug out of the archives in Ottawa and returned home to Alberta. Treaty 7 is on public display at Fort Calgary until mid-October. Five First Nations signed the nine-page document in 1877 at Blackfoot Crossing. The exhibit attempts to explain some of the controversies around the agreement. Those who signed it faced language barriers and they might not have realized they were surrendering their land. We'll zoom into that boundary and then we can see the extent of the reserves. And a map of Canada got a major digital update today. Google has added more than 3,000 reserves and treaty settlements to its mapping software. The collaboration between Indigenous communities and cartographers 
took seven years to complete. You saw the prime minister in question period today. That will be the last one for three months. The House of Commons has adjourned until September 18th. A Canadian is suspected of stabbing a police officer at a Michigan airport this morning. Amor Fatui is in custody. The officer he stabbed is in hospital. And now multiple investigations are underway, including in Montreal. That's where our Allison Northcott is tonight. Hey, city cars start towards the Bishop Airport. That's got an officer down there. The first call came in to police just before 10 this morning from the airport in Flint, Michigan, after a man armed with a 30 centimeter long knife attacked a police officer outside the screening area. Uh, when the subject went up to the officer and stabbed him, he can continued to exclaim Allah and he made a statement something to the effect of you have killed people in Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan and we are all going to die. Thus uh, our determining obviously this uh, we're going to investigate it as a terrorist act. Fellow officers tackled and handcuffed the suspect. Lieutenant Jeff Neville was rushed to hospital with stab wounds to his neck. He's expected to survive. He's a good friend of mine. It, yes, it was uh, very terrifying uh, to see something that quick um, and uh, respond. Uh, you know, <laughs> luckily, we were very, very close uh, distance to Respond. You know, what happened here at Bishop Airport is just a tragedy. I think it's absolutely awful and that a police officer was injured like this. The suspect is Amor Fatui, a Canadian who the FBI says is around 50 years old. He entered the U.S. legally on June 16th in Champlain, New York, then somehow made his way to Flint. Investigators believe he acted alone and say he is cooperating with police. It's suffice it to say uh, he, he has a hatred for the United States and a variety of other things which uh, in part motivated him towards coming to the airport today uh, to conduct this act of violence. Fatui remains in custody and has been charged with committing an act of violence at an international airport while police try to piece together who he is and what led him to Flint. Canadian authorities are also involved. There is complete cooperation between the RCMP and other Canadian authorities and agencies with all of their counterparts uh, in the United States and we will do everything we possibly can uh, to assist in this matter. This afternoon police descended on this Montreal apartment. Fatui's landlord says the suspect lived here for more than five years with his wife and children. Stunned neighbours say he was quiet. He was a father. He spoke with everyone, says Mohsin Azri. It's bizarre. Tonight, investigators in the U.S. and here in Montreal are continuing their work, and the FBI says Fatui could face further charges in the days ahead. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. There's anger in the United States Senate over the future of health care coverage for millions of people. It's being decided by 13 men, and what they're proposing remains a secret. Paul Hunter has that tonight. Welcome back to that seemingly never-ending struggle in America. Health care is a right, not a privilege. At issue this time, an attempt by the U.S. Senate to rewrite the U.S. health care system. Say Democrats... Their number one principal goal is tax cuts for millionaires, billionaires and giant corporations. Republicans see it differently framing it as seeking a better, smarter plan for all and fulfilling that long-standing pledge by Donald Trump to finally get rid of Obamacare. Recall that just last month, the House of Representatives passed its own rewrite, but critics slammed it after estimates that it threatened health care coverage for 23 million Americans, most of them low-income earners who, ironically enough, voted for Donald Trump in droves. Now the pressure's on for the Senate to come up with something that works for everyone. But what's angered many on Capitol Hill is that the new plan is being drawn up behind closed doors, frustrating even Republicans. No one has been shared it. We used to complain like hell when the Democrats ran the Affordable Care Act. Now they're doing the same thing. Do not let this go by without your voice. This week, you know, some Democrats even Facebook-lived themselves marching 
and taxiing on a kind of treasure hunt, searching in vain for the Republicans privately drawing up the new plan. Newsflash, we didn't get the bill. Am I one of the 23 million? Now, with fresh commercials highlighting the fears by Obamacare backers, along with the White House message on why it's got to go, details of the Senate proposal are expected to at last be made public tomorrow. Every member of the Senate will have it, and it will be posted online for everyone to review. But they won't have long to review it. The Senate's plan, which, if enacted, would revamp one-fifth of this country's economy, is to be voted on exactly one week later. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Tensions between NATO and Russia escalated today. Russia says a NATO fighter jet buzzed a plane that was carrying its defense minister. However, NATO says its F-16 tracked three Russian jets because they did not identify themselves. The encounter highlights tensions as NATO increases its military activity in Eastern Europe. Dozens of similar incidents have been reported in the past few years, including an encounter earlier this month when, according to the U.S., a Russian jet flew within two meters of an American spy plane. Iraqi forces say ISIS militants have blown up the Grand al-Nuri Mosque in Mosul. Built nearly 9,000 years ago, the historic landmark was where ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared a caliphate in 2014. Iraqi forces have since managed to take back most of Mosul, but the old city district remains under ISIS control. The United Nations says South Sudan is no longer classified as being in famine following an increase in foreign aid. It first declared famine for parts of the country in February, after civil war and an economic collapse. In March, the UN added three more countries, Yemen, Somalia, and Northeast Nigeria, saying the 20 million people facing famine and starvation made for the largest humanitarian crisis since the end of the Second World War. The UN said $4.4 billion in aid money was needed. Many countries and organizations responded. Our Margaret Evans reported on this crisis from South Sudan in April. Here she is now with more on today's update. Pennies from heaven. Aid drops like these remain crucial for so many in South Sudan. The difference between life and death. Today, a UN-backed report suggested that the worst of the famine has been pushed back in the counties where it was first declared in February. But it also found that food security across the country as a whole has deteriorated even further. Aid workers now warn against complacency. It shouldn't be confused with an end to the crisis. Unfortunately, what this latest data also shows is that six million people, it's more than one in two of every South Sudanese, is struggling to find food every single day. Donations from Canadians for famine relief in Africa and the Middle East are still being matched by Ottawa until the end of June. And Canadian aid dollars are already at work. The International Development Minister, Marie-Claude Bibot, just back from South Sudan. I can tell you that the needs are huge. Uh, this population need help, need uh, food, need basic services. Any gains in the fight against hunger in South Sudan are easily reversed in the midst of so much uncertainty. Many people unable even to attempt subsistence farming, driven from their land by fear or force or whatever comes first. More than two million people have been displaced since fighting began in the country in 2013, the conflict increasingly ethnic in nature. Many people have fled to UN protection of civilian camps. Others have left the country altogether. We see a thousand kids fleeing South Sudan every single day. They're crazy numbers. People overlook them. The burden is heavy on South Sudan's neighbors. Refugees arriving in Uganda carry with them the burden of what they've seen, along with the physical hardships. The legs are swollen, the children look malnourished, they're hungry. Without peace, there can be no end to South Sudan's hunger. For now, the lifeline, already worn and tenuous, cannot be withdrawn.
Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. 96-year-old Prince Philip has been admitted to hospital for treatment of an infection. He's said to be in good spirits, and it didn't stop the Queen from carrying out her planned schedule today, including her speech at the opening of the British Parliament. Prime Minister Theresa May is officially beginning the challenge of leading a minority government with a big issue hanging over the country. Nala Ayed reports. For the Queen, there was no carriage and no ceremonial dress, though the crown was there, and Prince Charles because of his father's illness. Despite the familiar rituals, this was a somewhat downsized affair. Many of the Prime Minister's campaign promises stripped away with the majority she lost. Her plan, read by the Queen, focused mostly on Brexit. My government's priority is to secure the best possible deal as the country leaves the European Union. Since the election, Theresa May's vision faltered. Stripped of her advisers, her Downing Street days seem numbered. And so far, marked by missteps like her cold reaction to the tragedy at Grenfell Tower. I think the past couple of weeks have been shattering for Theresa May. Uh, she is getting the show back on the road at the moment. She looks more composed and more statesmanlike, if you like, at the dispatch box. But the challenges are just massive. A week after that cruel blaze devoured the building, the neighbourhood is rife with questions and calls for justice, all tinged with unwavering grief. Hamid Jafari lost his 82-year-old father, Ali. His mother just now settled in an apartment. When I see these pictures, everything just reminds me of like a bad dream. What we can do, if we, even if we anger or nothing, he's not going to come back, you know. Yeah, the people who passed away, they passed, you know. The government announced it will rehouse survivors in the area in new luxury apartments. My government will initiate a full public inquiry into the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower to ascertain the causes and ensure that the appropriate lessons are learned. As Prime Minister, I apologise for that. But fate. May, isolated and diminished, well, might nice not last long enough to uh, see such an inquest through. There. There'll be some people who'll give her 10 days, some people will give her 10 months, some people would probably prefer not to give her 10 minutes, frankly. Uh, it is about the party deciding what the best way forward is. A small protest in the unusual heat today only hints at more tests ahead. Next week, it's Parliament voting on Theresa May's plan. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. It isn't publicly known what side of the Brexit debate the Queen favours, but that didn't stop social media from buzzing about the meaning of her headwear. See the colours of the EU flag? Some Twitter users are insisting the blue and yellow hat was no accident. Queen Elizabeth may not have any official political power, but she's been known to use her sartorial choices as a subtle force for diplomacy. When he was finished at Parliament, Prince Charles visited the North London suburb of Finsbury Park and spoke with community leaders in the wake of Monday's van attack. I never could underestimate just what a difference your contributions could make to maintaining harmonious relationships between different faiths and different communities in this country. Charles gave condolences on the Queen's behalf and observed tributes that have been left at the site. Eleven people were injured when a man swerved his vehicle into a group of Muslim worshippers gathering outside a mosque. One man died. He had fallen just before the attack and it's not clear yet what killed him. An autopsy is underway. Straight ahead, cyberbullying and a mental health crisis in Atlantic Canada. Have I got a panel for you. Five award-winning journalists, many in the areas of investigative journalism. They're known for their great reporting. I've, I've had some threats. Um, it's a reality. There are people out there that will write you nasty things. I think 
2002, we did a gang documentary and leading up to it, I think I had eight written death threats. I think gang leaders in Vancouver thought we were going to name them and out them and we don't do the work of the police. And we took some pretty extreme precautions. I have special glass on my back door, thanks to the CBC. Um, and you know, you can't find me easily. You really protect your children and your name because sometimes you never know who you're going to tick off. And we've done stories about organized crime. We've done stories about terror suspects, for example. And uh, when I talk to new journalists who we mentor, I often say, you know, be really careful about exposing your children and your family um, and being easy to find physically because there are people out there who can be dangerous. I have. I have relationships with my stories, and and I know that sounds strange, but I almost, uh, there have been times when I have come home from something awful where I can still smell like the iron of blood, and it doesn't leave my nose for a while, and I walk down the street and I sometimes feel like my stories are constantly tapping me on the shoulder, and I sort of, I have this little ritual with them where I let them do this for a while, and then at some point, I have caught myself standing in the street and saying, oh, Enough, enough, you've had your time, enough. You stay here, I'm gonna keep going. Very early in my career, I think I was 25, um, I, I certainly didn't look like I knew what I was doing and I'm not really sure that I did, but I remember interviewing someone and it, I was about to put something in front of him and, and accuse him of something. And I was actually sort of far more nervous than I ever wanted to give up, but he thought I was just adorable. <laughs> and I remember him actually trying to charm me by speaking a little French. And I was actually so annoyed at that point that he clearly thought I was no threat at all. That, you know, I stopped shaking, I stopped being nervous, and that might have been one of my finest moments ever. I remember it like 25 years later. So um, sometimes it's frustrating for all the same reasons that women in every profession have expressed their frustrations, but every now and then it works for you, and those are good. Mental health advocates in Nova Scotia are calling it a crisis. This school year alone, three junior high school students in Cape Breton have ended their own lives, with the latest, a 13-year-old girl, happening just this past weekend. She was a victim of cyberbullying, and as Angela McIver reports, the province has no way to legally combat online attackers. Madison Wilson was only 13 years old when she took her own life on Father's Day. She loved everything, loved her music, always on her phone. Amy Lynn Wilson says her daughter was being cyberbullied by classmates at Sydney Mines Junior High School. And even though they talked about it, Wilson never knew the extent of her daughter's suffering until it was too late. I always try to tell her it's what you think of yourself. It's not what other people think. Madison Wilson is the third junior high student in Cape Breton to die by suicide this school year. But as students seek mental health support, the options continue to shrink. The school board recently cut guidance counselor positions. And the wait time to see a child psychologist is at least a year. The province's newly appointed education minister says it's time to intervene. We're of course committed to doing whatever we can to, to make sure the supports that, that are there, um, that people know about them and can access them, and of course always open to, to enhancing these services. Nova Scotia already tried once and failed to combat cyberbullying. It was in direct response to the death of Retea Parsons in 2013. The 17-year-old attempted suicide and later died from her injuries. The Cyber Safety Act was meant to punish people who make threats online. And for two years, a team of investigators followed up on complaints by issuing warnings and court orders. Then in 2015, the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia deemed the law unconstitutional. The province hasn't even tabled a replacement. Madison Wilson's mother says people young and old need to be held accountable. A comment, a remark. A post. They don't realize what they're doing, and some people need to face what what they're doing. Her advice to parents: always demand a password, even if your child refuses. She said it could have saved her daughter's life. 
Angela McIver, CBC News, Halifax. The city of Red Deer declared a state of emergency today after a violent windstorm last night. The priority today, though, is uh, some crews will be assessing and giving inventory of the scope of the cleanup, but the main priority will be power restoration. 110 kilometer an hour winds uprooted trees, knocked down utility lines, and tore roofs off buildings. The city's mayor says the cleanup could take weeks. Still ahead tonight, a young Indigenous artist tells his story of crisis that spurred inspiration. But first... You can't buy a farm without income. They have the ambition. They have the livestock. All they're missing is land. But there's a solution in the hills. Next, though, the day's business numbers. The TSX decreased slightly. The Canadian dollar was down a quarter of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 57 points. The price of oil fell almost a dollar. Today's events were part of a program which has been going on since Wednesday evening. Gays and non-gays mingled at the fair, some coming from as far away as Holland and California. Well, there are a few hundred thousand gay people in the city of Toronto, and we felt that uh, the organized gay community wanted to have a celebration of our culture, our community, and this is, this is it. This is Gay Days. They say together they can work toward acceptance by general society. Though they marched through the streets today as they have before, the tone was less serious. There were no nightsticks, no confrontations. In the park, the atmosphere was festival. Gay pride uh, is an expression we use to say that uh, we're proud of our sexuality, that we're, uh, we're not ashamed to say that uh, our lifestyle is worth living. More than a thousand of the city's estimated quarter of a million gays and lesbians celebrated with a sense of humor. They even found a way to laugh at AIDS. <laughs> this is supposed to be a public celebration. It's ironic that at this event, some entertainers and some participants in the rally asked us not to take their picture. Gays and lesbians marching here fear reprisals for their lifestyle. A sweltering summer Sunday in the city. A day to meet friends. Lots of friends, as it turned out. It may have been the biggest block party of the season. The parade, too, was a hit, an indication of the self-confidence and self-assurance that lesbians and gays have acquired here in only a few years. It looked like a big outdoor party as marchers at Toronto's Gay Pride Parade moved through city streets to their own beat. We want to be strong because we're such a minority and we're not treated real well. This year, participants had something else to celebrate, the legal right to marry. Hundreds of thousands lined the streets. San Diego native Richard Reed and his partner Ernie Lacasse have been to Pride Parades before. This is their first as a married couple. For them, and for their fellow June brides and grooms, this year's parade is indeed a happy one. They're, <clears throat> they're circular, and uh, the inside of the rim is scorched a little. All around, and these circles are approximately 34 to 35 feet wide. It was a disc shape and it had a dome in the middle. Oh, it was a beautiful ship, it was a creamy white color. It's as if a giant cookie cutter has stamped out circles. They range from two to 20 meters in diameter and come in a variety of patterns. Some swirl clockwise, others fan out from the center. Around the crisp perimeter, the fields are intact. The plants are going through some form of molecular change, causing them to grow into uh, huge dartboard patterns. It's beyond anything we can suggest, and beyond any conventional science, the way this has been constructed. Visitors are coming from miles around to see the latest attraction near Conquest, Saskatchewan. It's the most excitement people in this area have seen in a while. One of the circles looks like a donut. Another has a tail pointing to the south. And on a nearby field owned by a Hutterite colony, there are six circles. In all of them, the stalks of wheat are flattened but not damaged. I'm not a great believer in UFOs, <laughs> but uh, once you see them right up close, they're different. It was the last thing John Petty expected to see. 
He was out bailing hay when something caught his eye. I thought it was very strange. I got off the tractor and came in and looked around and I couldn't believe my eyes. Not really much gets going on here in Howick, so this is something new. It's not just about the land, uh, uh, which is a, a very, very important part, but it's about the community as a whole. In many parts of rural Canada, communities are under threat, fearful about the future as more and more young people abandon that way of life. In one part of the highlands on Cape Breton Island, they're looking to the past as a way to try to preserve their future. It's a dream that in some respects will once again put cattle in the clouds. Here's Tom Murphy. Maybe this is what you know of Cape Breton Island. The scenery, the soundtrack. Welcome to Mabu, Nova Scotia, known for its Kaylees and its culture. Proudly handed down from generation to generation. Oh, here they come. In the same way the farmers here have taught their children to live off the land. And in these parts, raise cattle. Ready to go. A kind of farming that has seen better days. Okay, girl. A declining industry where the profit margins are often thin, the hours long and hard. No, the cattle business, it. it's not for everyone. It's stressful on me and my wife and five children, and yeah, it's, it's stressful, so. For some, farming is in their blood. Mm -hmm. People like Norman Kirsten. Hey, there you see. And yes, at just 28, he's already a father of five. Hey, with a sixth on the way. <laughs> he's gonna be on TV. He and Chrissy are high school sweethearts. Norman loves life in the country. Darcy, where's your shoes? And he's desperate to make cattle farming his career and raise his kids in Cape Breton. That mine. <laughs> he's a third generation Cape Breton farmer and he's trying to make it work. I've been involved with cattle my entire life. My father has a dairy farm and uh, my oldest brother's taking that over. So um, uh, I'm scratching and clawing with every opportunity I have to uh, do what I would love to do and raise my kids the way I want to raise my family. And He scraped together what he had and invested it in about 200 head of cattle, valued at close to $200,000. But there's a problem. I'm a registered farmer, but I have no place to keep my cattle in the summer times. That's right. Norman's a farmer with no firm. He has cattle, but no burn. It's a common problem among young people who want a life on the farm, their own farm. You can't buy a farm without income. And if you don't have cattle for income, you won't be able to, they won't even look at you at the bank. You know, it's, there's so many walls in front of us that we have to climb up and over and we fall off on the way up. For now, he shuttles his livestock around to rented farms, a few at a time, because he has no pasture of his own. This community wants to keep farming alive and ambitious young farmers in business so it's helping Norman and farmers like him climb the mountain in their way. This isn't your typical country road. It's a rough and rugged seven kilometer drive high in the Cape Breton Highlands. At the top, there's close to 200 hectares of pasture that's any farmers for the taking. Oh, hold it. And it might just be Norman's saving grace. Come on, guys. Is it important to you to get them up here? Tell me about that. Well, if I can't get them up here, well, then I have nowhere to put them, so it's very important to have them here, so. You need this for your farming operation. That's what it is, yeah. Are you ready to run? 
coming through. Almost. And anybody that doesn't have a firm number, we're going to put a tag on you. Right? Perfect. Saves me having to go and do it. Exactly. <laughs> okay, she's ready to go. Okay. The helping hand comes thanks to farmers like Chris Vandenhuvel, a successful Mabu dairy farmer and a driving force behind an effort to revive the community pasture. <clears throat> Depending on an animal's weight, you want to just pull that, Daryl? A farmer like Norman is charged up to 68 cents a day to have his cattle stay here. Each one is tagged so farmers can keep track of their cattle before they're let out to graze for the summer. If you can buy the cattle first and you can put them here and then you generate income that first year, then you can look for a place to keep them second, right? So without this place, it's, for me, I don't exist. So it's, uh, it is, I don't know what to tell you. It, it, uh, it's critical. It's critical, it's very critical. This place, high among the clouds, has quite a history. It's prime land cleared by early Scottish settlers. At one point, a vibrant little community on the Western Capes with its own post office, church, and school. But harsh winters and the call of modern conveniences eventually drove them down the mountain. The homesteads they built are now just shells evident to only those who take the time to look for them. So what do you think about when you, when you walk through these hills and you know the history of farming here and your back farming here, what do you, what do you make of it all? Well, I mean, uh, there is so much history here and it's important for us to, to reflect on that and to kind of keep that alive, right? Van and Hoovel grew up with the stories. What are we looking at right here, do you think? So this is, uh, this is a house foundation for uh, Archie Rankin's uh, uh, place. Uh, it would have been, this is his farmstead uh, uh, here. And if we, uh, if we look back over in this direction over there, that, uh, that pile of stones over there would have been where his barn would have been uh, located. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how many acres he would have uh, farmed up here, but uh, when you talk to the old folks, I mean, they kept a couple of beef cows and some sheep and some, some goats and pigs and, and mm -hmm. chickens and whatnot, so. They had something, right? It's a good place to raise cattle. Well, it's it's an incredible place. When you talk to some of the folks around that have been in, involved in agriculture for the last number of years around here, they always say that uh, the land up here in the Cape is some of the best in the province and, and definitely amongst the best in Cape Breton. More than 60 years ago, the government turned the area into a community pasture, cleared more land, a bid to keep the cattle industry strong back then. But then, a little more than a decade ago, mad cow disease knocked many older farmers out of business because they couldn't export their meat anymore. It was part of an overall trend that has seen close to three quarters of the Cape Breton farmland fall out of production. So the community pasture waned. But it's an idea whose time has come again. So what do you think when there's a guy like Norman there who's a young guy, young family he has to feed and take care of and he's decided agriculture is how he's going to do it and this land here in the highlands there might just help him do it yeah well i mean that's uh, to be honest with you that's exactly you know that type of fellow is exactly and that type of family is, is exactly who we were after when we uh, uh, uh and who we had in mind when we started to, to revitalize this uh, uh without this asset here it uh, it simply wouldn't have happened for him when you look at the bigger picture, it's not just about agriculture, it's a big, big picture that we're after and we're very, uh, uh, very glad to be part of it. Be a part of the not-for-profit effort that is nurturing, preserving a way of life that has sustained people here for generations. Before these cows could graze these pastures again, there was a lot of work to be done. Back in May, when the Cape's snow had barely melted away, hundreds of hectares of fencing needed repair. Right now, we have about 320 or so acres on this side fenced off. And uh, this year, the goal is to fence off the rest of it and, and uh, utilize everything on this side of the road. So. And all of it was done by volunteers, people from the communities around Mabu, 
people who want to see local farming live on. Chris Vanden Heuvel's own teenage daughters among them. We'll go over there, Chris, and we'll stop, and I'll just show the girls. So we're starting down by the pond? We're starting, no, right where you cross the road there. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right by that pond there, and then go around the woods, is it? Yeah. Maybe they'll one day see agriculture as an option for them. Oh, that's as far as that one goes? Yeah. Don't worry too much about those. It's a kind of a community project, the pasture. And um, it's an assembly line. It all works good, though. That's the community connection that I think that, uh, that farmers are particularly in tune to. It's not just about the land, uh, uh, which is a, a very, very important part, but it's about the community as a whole. Taking their cattle here means farmers can free up their own land, if they have it, to make hay for winter. So they lug the cattle up to the Cape, putting them out to pasture beside their neighbors. We like, we like the lifestyle, yeah. so, yeah. You think you can do it? No, I know I can. There's a difference, I know. <laughs> I'm just gonna do it. What do you think the people who used to live here are, what are now ruins of these old properties? What do you think they would think about you guys revitalizing this? Uh, I, I would like to think that they're uh, that they're they're happy to see it. I mean, all of their uh, work that went into it, they'd probably think we might be a little bit crazy at the same time. I'm not sure. Because <laughs> they but, left, uh, remember? They left, yeah, <laughs> probably for a good reason. But all joking aside, I think that uh, uh, Cape Breton uh, especially is steeped in tradition and uh, that connection between younger generations and older generations is really strong and you see that in, in, in all of their culture, right, that, uh, that's prevalent here. I think that they would be happy and I'd like to think that they're looking down at us from above saying, yeah, good job. Yeah. I kind of think they are. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a special place. It's past the key to its future, a way of life being rescued by the very hills that helped shape it. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Mabu, Nova Scotia. Up next on National Aboriginal Day, we look at what being Indigenous means to one Edmonton artist.
Earlier, we showed you some of the events marking National Aboriginal Day. Here at CBC News, we've chosen the occasion to launch a new interactive initiative. It's called I Am Indigenous. We profile the lives of some changemakers and trailblazers. Over the next few nights, we will bring you those stories, beginning tonight with an artist and aspiring politician. My name is Aaron Paquette. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, and I am Indigenous. When I was 19 years old, um, I didn't feel like I was connected to community. I didn't feel like I was connected to myself. I didn't feel I had a, a place, uh, not only in my own life, but, but in my own country. And uh, so I found myself in the middle of the high-level bridge facing a choice. And the choice is one that a lot of Indigenous youth face, like, do I... Do I stay here? Do I continue struggling? Do I continue with this pain? And do I continue with this feeling of not being a part of something? And as I closed my eyes on that bridge, faced with that choice, just on the brink of, of whether I was going to live or not, uh, the sun started to rise. And I remember feeling this heat touch the top of my head and then my face. And I opened my eyes and there was, there was this beautiful sun in this beautiful morning. And in that moment, it's like I could hear the whisper of, of, of a loved one saying to me, you're here to laugh. And I started to cry because I just felt all of that pain and angst and, and, and aloneness slip off my shoulders. And, you know, I, I didn't jump off that bridge, thank God, but I flew. And uh, in that moment, my life became one of how do, I, how do I serve other people? How do I make my life have meaning by giving back to other people? And that's what I started to do. It wasn't something overnight. It wasn't that one day I woke up and everything was great. It's that because my focus changed, because I wanted to see how I could make my life be one of meaning by helping others, that slowly over time, everything else in my life began to change along with that attitude. A lot of Indigenous people are going to face some pretty, um, let's, I mean, let's, let's put it on the table, but they're going to face racism, they're going to face hate, they're going to face anger, they're going to face danger. And uh, those are the things that I experienced. And when that's your reality, and you don't see anything else, and you don't see how it can change, um, you can't help but start feeling more and more lonely. So I started painting, and I painted my aunties, my cousins, my cookums, my nieces in this painting. If there's a socio-economic ladder in Canada, Indigenous women are at the bottom, and they're the ones who need a stronger voice, and they need allies. And what that's done for me is by, by choosing to serve my community in that way, I've been able to expand that to serve many communities. And my work, for me, has become a bridge. And uh, one of the beautiful quotes we saw in the bridge yesterday was, I leave my past on this side and find my future on the other. One, two, three, oh, work for! Yeah. The reason I was interested in, in civic politics is because this is community. This is where it all happens. These are, these are the decisions that affect all of us on a daily, on a daily basis. And so, if I want to serve my community, and I do, this seems like an ideal way to do it. And you know, my mom was a big organizer in the communities that we grew up in, and so I was raised with the idea that to serve your community, you're active in your community, you're a part of it. And I can't see a better way to do that than to actually be on city council and making sure that every single person has a voice. I love Aboriginal Day because what it does is it allows everyone to see who we are and to see that we're not so scary, we're not so different, that we're, that we're healthy, we're vibrant, we're finally thriving in this Canada. And it also shines a light on, on, on some of the negative things. So if you see all the beautiful things, which is great, you also have to kind of take a look at, uh, at what's happening to our youth, what's happening to our children, are they getting the education, the health care? you know, the, the, all of the different things that the stable home life that other Canadians enjoy. And if they're not, why not? You know, you can point to a whole host of issues, but really 
what it comes right down to is that it's the choices that government has made for 140 years since the Indian Act was, came into being that has impacted uh, these communities for all this time in a negative way. It's only now that things are starting to change. And you'll see that now, indigenous culture, indigenous, indigenous voices are starting to blossom and flower and explode across the Canadian societal fabric. And it's adding something beautiful to that. So there's an untapped possibility here. If we can get over these 140 years to build something really, really wonderful and strong together. You can find all the profiles at cbcnews.ca slash I am indigenous. Still ahead, we go grocery shopping with the Minister of Health as the government mulls changes to food labels. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, she was a stray searching for scraps in a camp of marathon runners attempting the Gobi Desert Race. In the end, the dog found man, and their journey is retold on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. This afternoon in St. John's, Newfoundland, a young man named Terry Fox started running. Many people have run or walked across Canada, but Fox hopes to be the first to do it with an artificial leg. I got a lot of positive attitude and I think I can do it. He calls his running style the Foxtrot. After 25 days in Newfoundland, Terry had raised $25,000. That song was commissioned by the Cancer Society, which had its own doubts when he started off. Now, as he pounds out the kilometers, the money pours in, most of it in cash. He's got all the guts in the world. And I wish him all the luck in the world, too. And I hope he makes it. What do you think of Terry Fox? I think he's great. He'll make it. He'll make it. The run to City Hall, down University Avenue, took Terry by hundreds of people. It was an emotional moment for many of them. I knew I was going to make 20 miles. But when people are out there like that, oh, it was incredible today. We've seen him surrounded by crowds of supporters, but the crowds go home. Terry keeps running. I'm stubborn and competitive, and I, I don't know, I, I really enjoy life. I enjoy challenges. I don't like people feeling sorry for me. I don't like pity, and I wanted to show these other people what I could do. The National with Norton Nash. Good evening. A story of incredible courage came to an end today. At a news conference. Yesterday I was running and I had noticed a little bit of hardness in breathing. And I, had to, I decided I had to go see the doctor. And it was discovered then that the cancer had spread. And now I've got cancer in my lungs. And uh... From one end of the country to the other, there has been a spontaneous outpouring of support for Terry Fox and cancer research. Rarely, if ever, have so many people been so deeply moved by one individual. If it comes to the point where I'm told I'm going to die of cancer, I haven't got a chance, I've got to be able to face that. And Good evening. Terry Fox died this morning in a British Columbia hospital, one month before his 23rd birthday. Well, he was a very brave boy, I must say, and I feel very, very sad about it. Don't cry, love. It's all right. Don't cry, sweetie. It's all right. I think he touched the hearts of a lot of Canadians, and they all really look up to him. More than our sympathy, we would like you to express as well our profound gratitude for the gift which Terry gave to all of us, the gift of his own boundless courage and hope. Canadians everywhere walked and jogged and ran to raise money for the fight against cancer. He accomplished more in a few short months than most of us can hope for in a lifetime. An update now to a story we told you about last week. The sole railway line into Churchill, Manitoba has been out of commission since late May. It's been determined that until the flooded ground freezes, 
Repairs cannot be made. But that didn't stop one journey. Motorcyclists from Colorado decided to forego the warnings and ride north. And they're causing a stir by calling the tracks dry and fixable. Not exactly an expert opinion. However, they took photos and got in touch with Churchill's mayor. He says the photos are encouraging. Via Rail has asked to meet with the motorcyclists to find out more about their journey. And Transport Canada says Omnitrax, the operator of the Churchill port, has hired a third-party engineer to inspect the rails. A trip to the grocery store can feel overwhelming. There are so many options and a lot of labels to read. The federal government wants to encourage Canadians to make healthy choices with a new, more prominent warning system. But as Susan Lund reports, the proposal isn't sitting well with some in the food industry. You've been here, after work, looking for something quick for dinner. So has the federal health minister. I know how busy I am as a mom. I do grocery shopping and I'm flying through the aisles quickly. She wants to make it easier to pick foods that are good for you and avoid ones high in sugar, salt and saturated fat. So new warning symbols, stop signs or triangles are coming to the front of many food packages. You know what the yogurt section looks like. There's hundreds of different kinds of yogurt. So how do you figure out quickly, oh, this kind is actually a high sugar product. I might not choose that. In France, for example, they've been eating cheese for years and centuries. Canada's dairy farmers don't like the government's proposed cautions against eating too much cheese and yogurt high in fat or sugar, saying it focuses too much on what is bad. There's zinc, there's potassium, there's a vitam vitamin B, vitamin C. There's a lot of other nutrients that needs to be comprehend when you're thinking about a balanced diet. Food manufacturers aren't happy either. CBC obtained a report they presented to Health Canada in May, outlining concerns those warning symbols will leave the public with the perception that there is inherent danger from consuming the product. Philpott says there is one way companies can avoid the label. Maybe they should make it with a little bit less sugar or salt. That'll be to Canadians' benefit. Industry also says all these changes to packages could cost $1.8 billion. Philpott is sympathetic but says there's also the cost of people not making good choices in what they eat. Diabetes is one of our number one public health challenges in this country and if we can help Canadians make choices so that they're not eating such a sugary diet then that will be the the health benefits of that will far outweigh uh, the costs that we do recognize are associated with some of these regulatory changes. Philpott says no final decisions have been made on any of these changes. Health Canada is still consulting with industry and with you. You have another month to give your opinion on the new Canada Food Guide. Susan Lund, CBC News, Ottawa. And that's The Nationalist Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.